Amen. You can be seated, church. I just want to say, it's good to see all of you after the government stole our sleep. Amen? I am glad you are all here. I'm a little chippy about the fact that I lost an hour of sleep last night, but it's okay. Well, this morning we're going to be back in our series, uh, really looking at church membership and what we believe as a church family. Uh, this will be our fourth sermon looking at our church's statement of faith. And so far, we have seen what the Bible says and what we believe about God himself in the Bible. We have seen what we believe about the creation and fall of mankind into sin and then the way God has rescued us from that fallen state. And then a few weeks ago, we looked at what we believe about sanctification. And in that message, we answered the question, how do we grow in our spiritual maturity? This week, we are going to look at what we believe, what do we believe the Bible says about the two ordinances that Jesus has given the church. Now, before we dive into that, I just want to say a big thank you uh, for your generosity and the way our church got behind World Missions last week. Uh, I was so encouraged to see how you stepped up and the ways that you were generous. And we have some exciting announcements in regards to our missions trip that we're going to be uh, letting you know here in the next few days. But let's keep praying and let's keep leaning into, yes, what God is doing here in Fresno, but also what God is doing around the world and being part of the global church to advance his kingdom. Well, this morning, we're going to be looking at what does the Bible say about the two ordinances that God has given the church. These two ordinances are communion and baptism. Now, if you were to go to dictionary.com and you were to look up the word ordinance, there would be a few different ways you could find that word is defined. You would find that it can be an authoritative rule or law, a decree or command. It can be defined as a public injunction or regulation, like a city ordinance against excessive horn blowing. How many of you would think that's a good city ordinance to have? Uh, some, another definition is something believed to have been ordained as by a deity or destiny. So that's part of what, how we define the word ordinance in, in the biblical sense. It also has a, an ecclesiastical definition, which is an established rite or ceremony. Uh, some traditions will call it a sacrament. Some would say, well, that's communion. So these are some different definitions of the word ordinance when you were to go to like look it up in the dictionary. Now, obviously, we're not talking about city ordinances this morning. We're talking about the ecclesiastical ordinances that God has given the church. We're talking about the established ceremonies that are meant to be means of grace in our lives. Now, as you read scripture, I know there are many more means of grace than just these two things. Uh, but these two things are set apart as ordinances uh, because we see them ordained or commanded by Jesus himself. Uh, they're given special attention throughout the New Testament. And they're distinct because when we observe these things, we are embodying, we are proclaiming the gospel in unique ways. These two ordinances engage our senses and our whole being in unique ways that other means of grace don't. And so as we look at each of these ordinances, we're going to see in the scripture where Jesus commands these to the church. And we're also going to look at verses that show us the church observing and practicing these things. Also, I want to say up front, as we consider these, I want to say up front that these ordinances do not save us. Partaking in the ordinances, partaking in communion or being baptized, do not earn you salvation. They do not make you fit to receive God's grace. They are how we as a church testify that we as individuals in the church are in fact saved. When somebody gets baptized, we as the church are, as much as we can tell, affirming their salvation. And when we partake in communion, we do the same thing. They are, the ordinances are how we as a church remember our salvation and affirm one another's salvation. This is why we ask when we're doing communion, if you're not a believer, to not partake in communion. Because this is reserved for the church, those that have been saved. This is also why we don't baptize unbelievers or infants. We'll talk about more about that in a few minutes. Uh, these ordinances help us to remember and celebrate and to some degree outwardly embody what we believe to be inwardly true. They are both acts of the church as a whole and the individual believer. Both are given to us as signposts of the gospel. Uh, author Bobby Jamieson said, baptism binds one to many. When we baptize somebody, that's us declaring, hey, you are now part of us. You are now part of the church. We believe, we affirm your salvation and that you are part of the body of Christ. So baptism binds one to many, whereas communion binds many 
into one. And we're going to see in Scripture how when we partake in communion, we're doing it as one. We're reminding ourselves that we are one body. This is why we separate them from other means of experiencing the grace of God. So our statement of faith says, we believe that God has given the church two ordinances, baptism and communion. Baptism is the water immersion of a believer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and is a public identification of belief in Jesus. It displays the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and is symbolic for the believer's new life in Christ. Communion is a regular reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus. As we partake of the bread and cup, we are reminded of how the body of Jesus was broken and his blood was shed for us so that our sin could be forever forgiven, that we are now one body in Christ, and we are eagerly waiting for his return. So let's start this morning by looking at communion. If you have a Bible, turn to Matthew 26. As is our tradition, I'm going to read the whole chapter, and full disclosure, this one's a long one, guys. It's uh, over 70 verses, so it, it won't be up on the screens, but if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn to Matthew 26. If you need a Bible, there's going to be a black one close to you. Feel free to use those. If you want to use uh, your phone or a tablet, I preach from the Christian Standard Bible, and that's the translation that we'll be using if you want to pull that up there. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 26. I'll read this entire chapter. In this chapter, we see communion first instituted by Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 1. The Bible says, When these things had finished, or when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he told his disciples, You know that the Passover takes place after two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest, who was named Caiaphas. And they conspired to arrest Jesus in a treacherous way and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so there won't be any rioting among the people. That's the Passover festival that's taking place. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste? they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring out this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly, I tell you that wherever this gospel is proclaimed, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out thirty pieces of silver for him. And from that time, he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into a certain city, or go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus uh, directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, surely not I, Lord. He replied, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Judas, the betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told them. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup after giving thanks. He gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, Tonight all of you will fall away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd... And the sheep of the flock will be scattered. 
But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter told him, even if everyone falls away because of you, I will never fall away. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to him, tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Even if I have to die with you, Peter told him, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there to pray. Taking along Peter and two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay away from me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, So you couldn't eat, so couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. The one I kiss, he's the one. Arrest him. So immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Friend, Jesus asked him, why have you come? Then they came up, took hold of Jesus, and arrested him. At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword, and he struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Then Jesus told him, put away your sword back in its place, because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my Father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? How, then, will the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit teaching in the temple and you didn't arrest me. But all this happened so that the writings of the prophets would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were convened. Peter was following him at a distance, right to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and was sitting with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they could not find any even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward, stated, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. The high priest said to them, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed! Why do we still need witnesses? See, now you have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat on his face and beat others and beat him. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who is it that hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, You really are one of them. 
since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. Let's pray, and then we will look at the first ordinance of communion. Lord, I know this is a sobering passage as we consider communion, where you institute it. Lord, our hearts are heavy to consider how you instituted this ordinance right before you died. And I pray this morning that as we look into your word, your spirit would anoint the preaching of your word, and that as we consider these ordinances, we wouldn't, we wouldn't look at them as dead, empty tradition, but that we would look at them as signposts, as a way to embody and declare to each other the gospel, how you did sacrifice yourself for us. And I pray as we consider them this morning that you would renew in us a sense of appreciation, a sense of meaning, a sense of depth that they really have so that as we leave here, Lord, in a little bit of a deeper way, we could be more of those righteous trees that you have planted to glorify you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now, the first thing I want to notice about communion this morning is the context that the first communion was given in. As we read in Matthew chapter 26, we saw that Jesus instituted communion during the Passover feast. Now, this is significant because the Passover was a feast. It was a longer celebration. There was many days of it that we saw. It was a feast that was to remind the nation of Israel of their deliverance from slavery into Egypt. We see this instituted back in Exodus at the first Passover when the uh, judgment passed over those who were covered by the blood. In the middle of the Passover meal, Jesus uses the elements of the Passover meal. He uses the elements that were to remind them of their deliverance from Egypt. He uses those elements as signs to show the type of death that he would die. And in so doing, he's instituting a new covenant. From now on, Jesus is saying, you're going to remember a new and better deliverance. From now on, you're going to remember a new and better covenant. The bread and cup and communion serve as signs that remind us of the broken body and shed blood for Jesus. This is why he said in verses 26 through 30, Take and eat. This is my body. This is going to be broken for you. And then he took the cup after giving thanks, said to him, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What Jesus is doing is, is he's the backdrop of this first communion. He's using that to commemorate deliverance, to show them you're about to receive a better deliverance. Now, eating and drinking uh, were common practices in the presence of God throughout Israel's history. It was a symbolic way where they could symbolize and embody their relationship and communion with God. Uh, when the leaders of Israel went up on Mount Sinai to meet God, they beheld God and ate and drank in Exodus 24. There was a group of almost, I believe it was over 70 of these leaders. They go up on the mountain together and they behold God and then they feast in the presence of God. It was a way they could symbolize their communion with him. In Deuteronomy, the people of Israel would tithe their crops. They would set aside 10% so that on the annual feast, they could take that 10% to Jerusalem and feast before the Lord at their annual festival. In the Old Testament, they had sacrifices and ceremonies and meals and feasts that would point to the fact that they needed deliverance. It would point to the fact that their sin was not yet paid for because these sacrifices had to be repeated year after year after year. Uh, the, bu the book of Hebrews tells us this. Now, when Jesus institutes communion, what he's doing is he's like, I am giving you a better meal because it reminds us that our sins have forever been paid for. You don't need to do this feast anymore on an annual basis to remind you that your sin still needs forgiveness, that your sin still needs to be atoned for, that you still need sacrifices to cover your sin. With the backdrop of communion, what Jesus is saying is he's saying, I'm giving you a better feast. I'm giving you a better covenant. I'm giving you something that's permanent. There is no more sacrifice needed to, for your sins. Jesus is showing us that he is the fulfillment of what the Passover was a shadow of. It was a reminder of their deliverance 
from Egypt, but, but it was also a consistent reminder that sacrifices still needed to be made for their sin. And what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I'm instituting a better covenant now. I'm giving you a better feast. I'm giving you something better to celebrate. That I am the once and for all final sacrifice for sins. This is the backdrop of the first communion. And this shows us that in communion, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. In communion, we remember the cross. Fast forward to the church of Corinth. And we see the early church observing this ordinance on a regular basis as they would gather together. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, we read about that in Matthew 26, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this. Do this ordinance. Eat this feast in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Communion is both how we remember and proclaim the gospel. But we also want to clarify that the elements are signs to proclaim his broken body and shed blood. They are not the literal body and blood of Jesus. He says when you eat the bread and when you drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death till you come. Now in some traditions, a priest, uh, predominantly the Roman Catholic tradition, a priest will hold up bread in a mass and say, this is my body, quoting Jesus, and they believe at that moment it becomes the actual body of Christ. And they will teach that every time a mass is held and they do this, the sacrifice of Jesus is being repeated. But we must recognize that Jesus would often speak of himself in symbolic ways. He would say, I am the vine, I am the door. He wasn't saying, I'm a literal vine. <laughs> it's not like Jesus saying, look, here's the hinges and I can swing open. No, he's speaking symbolically, and that's what he's doing here is he's instituting communion. None of his disciples would have thought that loaf of bread was the actual literal body of Jesus. The same is true of the cup. Uh, this tradition also fails to recognize the finality of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Consider Hebrews 9, 25 through 28. The writer of Hebrews says, He did not do this to offer himself many times, as the high priest entered the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the renewal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as, it is, just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. In John 19, 30, Jesus says, it is finished. The work of justification is done. Jesus does not need to be sacrificed over and over and over again so that we can continually experience forgiveness. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was the once and for all payment of sins. So to take communion as a way we remember Jesus' sacrifice and to say it is continually a sacrifice, it's to go back under the old covenant. It's to go back under our need to, be, to have our sins continually sacrificed for and that's not what Jesus is declaring in the new covenant. Communion is how we declare Jesus has once and for all sacrificed himself. Not that Jesus needs to be sacrificed over and over and over again. Communion reminds us that our sins have been forever forgiven. Not that we are still in need of forgiveness. Communion is how we declare we are in Christ. Communion is a symbol of all the benefits that are ours because of Christ's sacrifice. It affirms his love for us. It affirms our faith in him. And when we take the elements, when we take the bread and we take the cup, we declare his sacrifice and that we are trusting in his sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. In communion, we remember the cross. In communion, though, we also realize that we are one body. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 14 through 17, Paul says this, so then, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I am speaking as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I am saying. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The blood that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? 
Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. Our participation in communion is a declaration that we are one. When we partake in communion, it is a visible declaration of our unity in Christ. We saw in our first message in this series how when we got saved, we are redeemed to God, but we are also redeemed to the people of God. Communion is how we affirm that we are one body in Christ. We saw in our very first message that this is why communion is reserved only for believers in Christ. Because if you're not a part of the body, if you're not a believer, you can't publicly declare that you're part of that body that you're not actually a part of. Now, in the next chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul rebukes the church at Corinth because they were taking what should have been a declaration of unity and they were using it to actually cause division. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22. He says, now in giving this instruction, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Indeed, it is necessary that there be factions among you so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. When you come together, then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper, so one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this manner. Communion is something that the entire church comes together to do. We see this in this passage that they're, when they observe communion, they're coming together as a church. This is why we don't partake in communion as part of our private devotions or even in our small groups. It's reserved for the whole church gathering. But it seems in 1 Corinthians 11 that the affluent members at the church of Corinth would arrive before the poor members of the church at Corinth. They would eat the bread, they would get drunk off the communion wine, and in so doing, humiliate the poor members who had nothing. It was like, ha, we got the feast, and you guys, you guys are just stuck without. And it would humiliate them, because it would bring to light how they were actually poor. Instead of communion bringing unity, despite economic differences, the church at Corinth was using it to highlight and divide because of those differences. This is why Paul says later in chapter 11 that each person needs to examine himself. The idea of self-reflection and communion is not, well, I've got to frantically make sure that I haven't forgotten to tell God sorry for something. <laughs> no, Paul calls for self-reflection while we're observing the ordinance of communion to make sure that we are living in unity with our fellow members of Christ's body. The act of communion says that we are one. There may be a communion service where in that time of self-reflection, you need to quietly slip out of your seat, ask to speak to a fellow member and say, hey, can we go talk in the lobby for a minute? I got to make something right with you. I, we, we, I haven't been living as one with you and I need to make that right before we take communion. That's okay. That's what Paul's calling us to in self-reflection. It's not about making sure that I've got all my ducks in a row and I can say, woo, I'm a good Christian so I can take communion. None of us are perfect. None of us are good enough. That's the point. It is about making sure that I'm living in unity with my fellow believers because communion says we're one body. And if we declare by observing the ordinance that we are one body, but we are not living in that way, Paul says we're partaking in communion in an unworthy fashion. And he gives some strong warnings for that. Self-reflection is also about making sure that our lives are not boldly contradicting our claim to be Christ's followers. We see in 1 Corinthians 5, we see this in 1 Corinthians 5, when Paul tells us not to partake in communion or even fellowship with someone who professes to be a believer but is living in open, unrepentant sin after multiple calls to repent. This is why we believe communion is only for professing believers who are in good standing with their local church because it declares we are one body. And we want to make sure that we are living in unity together as one body. In communion, we declare that we are one. And lastly, in communion, and I, and I have to admit, this one's new for me as I've been studying it this week. In communion, we also anticipate the marriage supper of the Lamb. We have seen how a meal in the presence of Jesus is an embodiment of our communion with Him. 
It's how we embody. It's how we physically practice and reflect that I'm in communion with Jesus. Because of Jesus' once and for all payment of sin on the cross, we are free to enjoy it unhindered fellowship with God. Let that reality sink in for a moment. Because of Christ's once and for all payment and sacrifice on the cross, you and I can enjoy unhindered fellowship with God. And as we observe communion, what we're doing is we are mentally, we are emotionally, we are even physically, through the act of eating, reminded that I can always enjoy my fellowship with God and that we are one body and we can come together in the presence of God and enjoy sweet, unhindered fellowship. Now, as amazing as that gets, it gets even better. (laughs) Communion reminds us that Jesus' payment for our sins has already been accomplished, so now we can eat in the Lord's presence. Yet, even in communion, there is an anticipation for an even better fellowship in God's presence in the future. Jesus hints at this in Matthew 26. I don't know if you noticed this, but in verse 29 he says, But I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So what Jesus is saying is, there's another feast coming, guys. The church is the bride of Christ, but the wedding hasn't happened yet. If you've got a Bible, flip to Revelation 19. I think these verses will be up on the screen. Verses 6 through 9. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory, because... The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he also said to me, These words of God are true. This shows us that there's an even better, more blessed feast still coming. This feast will be like the Garden of Eden, restored, but even better. Because then we'll not only be saved from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. We'll be redeemed to the fullest extent, to the point that we can't sin anymore. We can't sin ever again. And so this is an even better feast. And when we observe communion, we are anticipating, we are looking forward to that day at the marriage supper of the Lamb when we have the best feast. This is when Jesus will once again drink from the fruit of the vine with us in his Father's kingdom. This is when our faith becomes sight. This is when every good desire is finally and fully fulfilled. I love how Isaiah prophesies about this moment in Isaiah 25. Verses 6 through the first part of verse 10. Isaiah says, On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast of choice meat. A feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine. On this mountain he will swallow up the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. When he has swallowed up death once and for all, the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and he will remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth. For the Lord has spoken on that day it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation, for the Lord's power will rest on this mountain. What a day that'll be. When we observe communion, we're anticipating that. We're anticipating that feast with, I mean, I get excited, prime cuts of choice meat. Come on. In the meantime, we trust, we hope, we wait, and we anticipate. So in communion, we look back to the cross to remind ourselves forgiveness has been won. The once and for all sacrifice of Jesus has forever secured our salvation. It's secured our forgiveness. 
we look around at each other in communion. We remind ourselves we are one body, the body of Christ gathered together to worship him. And we also look ahead to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's communion. But there's another ordinance Jesus has given the church, and that's baptism. Baptism is the other ordinance that Jesus has instructed the church to observe. Now, in Matthew 16, we see Jesus is beginning to lay the foundation for the church. And in Matthew 16, Jesus says that he gives the keys to the kingdom of God to the church and to the apostles. This means that they can bind on earth and what is bound in, what is bound in heaven, or they can loose on earth what is loosed in heaven. Jesus has given the church as his body the authority to declare this is bound in heaven or this is loosed on earth. We also see in Matthew 18 that this authority means Jesus has given the church the authority to confirm or not confirm a person's salvation as much as we can tell. Matthew 18, 17 through 20. Jesus says, if he doesn't pay attention to them, again, this is on the backside of we've pursued, we have called this person to repent, and they're just refusing to repent. Jesus says, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. Why? Because Jesus has given the church special authority. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two or three of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Jesus has given his heavenly authority to the gathered church. And he is present with the gathered church to authorize the gathered church to speak in his name. Now, if that church is only two or three, or two or three thousand, it's, it doesn't matter because Jesus' authoritative presence is there. This is why two Christians who bump into each other at grocery outlet don't constitute a church, right? You're not gathered together as a church. You're gathered together there to buy groceries. <laughs> you can't be like, hey, here's a trough. Let's baptize somebody. No, because you're, that's not the church, right? It's the gathered church together that Jesus has given the authority to do this. Now, two or three people are all you need to form a church. So if there's two or three people, two or three believers in a place where there's no church, hey, it's time to get one started. We've got all that we need because Jesus is with us. But now this context is important to understand as we approach the Great Commission where Jesus commands, us, commands the church to baptize. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority, again, here's this authority bit that we saw in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always till the end of the age. So Jesus reminds us that, hey, the authority is really mine, but that his authoritative presence is always with his gathered church. I mean, there's going to be days... Like today, where the worship team nails it, and the song set is great, and we are believe, we believe, we can feel I'm in the presence of God. There's going to be days where the sermon's a dud, <laughs> and I preach too long, and I'm too monotone, and it's boring, and you're not going to feel it, but that doesn't mean Jesus' authoritative presence wasn't there. His authoritative presence is with the gathered church. The context that Jesus lays out in Matthew 16 and in Matthew 18 doesn't somehow magically disappear by the time we get to Matthew 28. The command to the church, the place of Jesus' authoritative presence, is to make disciples and then to baptize them and then to teach them. This is why we believe the church has been commanded and has the authority to baptize new believers, thus affirming their salvation. Now, there may be situations where a person becomes a believer, but there is no church to baptize them. What do you do then? Well, Acts 8 gives us a perfect example of what to do. Acts 8, 36 through 40, we see Philip leads the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. What do we do in the situation where there is no church to do the baptizing? Well, as we see in Acts chapter 8, the person that presented the gospel can baptize that person because he is acting in the place of a church in that situation. But we need to realize that the authoritative presence of Jesus is connected to a gathered church or the apostles. So if you have two or three Christians in a location, but there's no church there, it's time to get one started. Because you've got all you need. 
If a church is only two or three people, that's okay. This is why we don't look down on small churches and we're not enamored by big churches. Jesus said, if two or three people are gathered, that's all you need. Jesus' authoritative presence is there. Now, it also needs to be said that while Jesus has given the church the authority to baptize someone as a means of affirming their salvation, he also tells the church, we do not have the authority to refuse baptism to a person who is giving evidence of salvation. We see this in Acts chapter number 11. In fact, in Acts 11, this passage, we see um, in the book of Acts, when the Jewish believers would get saved, they were baptized right away and they received the Holy Spirit right away. The one um, exemption from this would be the Apostle Paul. When he got baptized, there was three or four days, or when he got saved, there was three or four days before he got baptized. Because Jesus appeared to one of the disciples and said, you need to go baptize this guy. This guy's a believer now, and he had to travel to get there, and everybody was like, yeah, but this is Saul. <laughs> and so there was a person that Jesus said, I want you to lead the church in recognizing that Saul is now a believer. But in every other place, when a Jewish person would get baptized, they received the Holy Spirit, or when they got saved, they received the Holy Spirit, and then they got baptized. But it was a little bit different with the Gentile believers. They would believe, but Jesus wanted to wait until his Holy Spirit was there so that the Jewish believers could recognize, oh, Gentiles can now be saved too. This isn't just about our ethnic line anymore. This is for all people. Like we see prophesied throughout the Old Testament, like we read about in Isaiah, it's all people, it's all nations. But Jesus waited because he wanted the Jewish believers to see the Holy Spirit descending on this believer so the Jewish believers could recognize, oh, this is now for Gentiles too. And in Acts chapter number 11, what we see is the Jewish church actually affirming Gentiles' salvation, and immediately after they affirm their salvation, they baptize them. And so while the church has been given the authority to baptize people as a way of affirming their salvation, he has not given the church authority to not baptize people who are showing signs of salvation. In fact, it's just the opposite. But in ordinary circumstances, baptism is both the church and the individual making a public statement that this person is indeed a part of the body of Christ. Like we said at the beginning, baptism binds the one to many. Communion binds many into one. Baptism is how the church says, this person belongs to Jesus. And we affirm that. We believe that. As much as we can humanly tell, we believe this person is a believer and they're part of the body of Christ. The command has been given to the church and the church has the authority to obey that command. Aren't you glad God doesn't give us commands to obey without empowering us or giving us the authority to do so? Now in Acts chapter number 2, we also see Peter commanding individual believers to be baptized. Acts chapter number 2, verses 37 through 38. When they heard this, this was after Peter preached at Pentecost. When they heard this, they were pierced to their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We could have a healthy discussion on whether or not this is a command to all Christians or just to those Peter is specifically talking to. But as we see throughout the New Testament, baptism is for all believers. What happened after Peter tells them, repent and be baptized? Well, in just a few short verses later, Acts 2.41, those who accepted his message were baptized. And the same day, there were 3,000 people were added to them. Throughout the New Testament, baptism usually happens immediately after salvation. Uh, if you go onto our website after the, ser after the service and you look at the sermon, there's a, I'll, there'll be a link to my notes. And in my, I have like a footnote in my notes here of lots of instances of Scripture where people repent and believe. They get saved and then they get baptized. They get saved and then they get baptized. They get saved and then they get baptized. Throughout the New Testament, that's the way it usually happens. People believe and then they get baptized. And like we see in Acts 2, calls to repentance are usually immediately followed by calls to get baptized. Now, Scripture is clear that it is faith in Jesus that saves us. It's not good works. Baptism is not what saves you. But that doesn't mean we put off baptism. Oh, well, it's not what saves me, so it doesn't matter. We can't say that either. Baptism is how we go public with our faith. Jesus instructs the church to obey all of his teachings, right? That includes the commands 
He gave right before that. Make disciples and be baptized. And so if we're going to obey Jesus' command, we should get baptized. Baptism is how we go public, that we are disciples and that we are believers in Jesus. I cringe a little bit whenever people talk about being a part of the body of Christ. Is I'm on team Jesus. Forgive the metaphor. I think it works here. When you get saved, you're a part of the body of Christ. Getting baptized is like putting on the jersey. It's like publicly saying, I am a believer in him. 1 Peter 3.21, Peter says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as, the normal, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, a first glance at that verse, and you're like, uh, sounds like Peter's saying baptism saves you. But if you back up and you read that verse in its entire context, you can better understand what Peter's saying. 1 Peter 3, if you back up to verse 18 and read through verse 22, this is what the passage says. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient. When God patiently waited in the days of Noah, or when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Peter is not saying the ordinance of baptism saves you. He makes that clear by saying it's not the removal of dirt from your body. It's not the physical act of baptism that's what's saving you. It's your faith in the resurrection. Baptism corresponds to your faith in the resurrection. Baptism corresponds to it. Baptism pictures it. Baptism declares our faith. It's a picture of our salvation, just like Noah was saved in the ark. And I'll say this. If you're nervous about publicly proclaiming your faith, don't look at baptism as a hindrance to that. Look at baptism as a way to help you do that. Baptism is how, it's a very helpful way where you can publicly proclaim your faith. But if a person doesn't want to publicly declare their new faith in Christ, that should be cause for some self-reflection. Jesus has pretty strong warnings for those who deny him before others. I understand sometimes it, it, we, we can get nervous about sharing our faith. People might be nervous about getting up in front of a church and being baptized and, you know, telling the church, I'm now a believer in Christ. But that's the whole point. It's a public declaration that I'm a part of the body of Christ because baptism portrays our new life. We saw that in 1 Peter. We also see this in Romans 6. Romans 6, verses 3 through 4, Paul says, Are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Water baptism corresponds to what Paul's talking about here. It's a symbol of how we were baptized in Christ and how Christ has raised us from the dead. It's a symbol of the gospel's application in a person's life. It's a dramatization of what happens when we place our faith in Christ. It's a public picture of a person's union with Christ and his death, his burial, and then his resurrection. This is partly why we do baptisms by submersion. You can't really picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for just sprinkling some water on a person. Based on what we can tell in Scripture, people who are, who are getting baptized, they go down into the water to get baptized, or they look for a large body of water. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was like, hey, here's a, here's a big body of water. What's keeping me from being baptized? The Greek word also, uh, baptize, it's baptizo. It means to dip, immerse, or submerge. Baptism is also something you only need to do one time. Communion is the ordinance that we use to continually remind ourselves. Baptism is the declaration that we are once and for all saved. And so since we're only saved once, we don't need to continue to be baptized. Now, if you got baptized, baptized, and you weren't a believer, some people have asked, well, do I need to get baptized again? Well, no, because you weren't baptized the first time. <laughs> you weren't a believer. <laughs> So you don't need to get baptized again. You need to get baptized for the first time. Like if you're at a swimming pool and you're saved, but you haven't been baptized yet, and your friend swims up behind you and like dunks you under, whoo, losing my glasses. 
<laughs> he dunks you under. That says, now you're baptized. That's not baptism. <laughs> That's your friend dunking you under the water. You don't need to do it again. You just need to do it. But if you have been saved and you have been baptized, you don't need to keep getting baptized as a way to keep rededicating yourself to Christ. Sometimes, you know, people will get saved and then they'll get baptized and then there'll be a time where they maybe slip away from the church or maybe it's like a prodigal son type moment and they walk away. Well, when they come back to Christ, they don't need to get baptized again because they were already saved and they were already baptized. Now, they may, they may want to wrestle with, well, was I saved to begin with? That's a different conversation. But if you are genuinely converted and baptized, you don't need to get baptized multiple times in order to rededicate yourself to Christ. Once you place your faith in Christ, you are forever secured in him. Baptism is a picture of that. And because baptism pictures that, we don't need to get baptized over and over. Baptism declares that you are now made new. This is also why we don't baptize infants. Um, some traditions will teach you that when you baptize an infant, it actually imparts saving grace to the child. Obviously, that child has not yet received saving grace, so we know that's not true. But there are other traditions, uh, like our Presbyterian brothers, who we would agree with on a lot of things. They don't teach baptizing infants saves the child. They will teach that it actually separates them as part of God's covenant people. Just as God extended his covenant promise with Abraham, and therefore the sign of the covenant to his people and their infant children, they will teach that so also he extends his new covenant promise and therefore the sign of that covenant promise of baptism to both believers and their children. Now, in the old covenant, that was true. They would extend that covenant to their, to their entire families and they would circumcise that boy when he was only eight days old. But throughout the Old Testament, we still see that they, that outward act of circumcision wasn't what saved him. They still needed to be circumcised in their hearts, Deuteronomy 10, 16. says, therefore, circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. You see, under the old covenant, God formed his people by familial descent into a distinct ethnic group, the nation of Israel. Circumcision was meant to be a reminder that they were ethnically set apart, but that their hearts still needed to be changed. It, it would remind them, God has set me apart, as his nation, and I need to make sure I'm walking in his covenant. I need to make sure that I'm living in holiness. Many were marked off as God's people, regardless of their spiritual state. I mean, read the Old Testament. It's full of examples of this happening. Ultimately, they needed a new heart. That's why the new covenant comes in. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 39 through 40 says, I will give them integrity of heart and action so that they will fear me always for their good and for the good of their descendants after them. I will make a permanent covenant with them. I will never turn away from doing good to them. I will put fear of me in their hearts so they will never again turn away from me. God is not forming his new covenant people the same way he formed his old covenant people. And to say, well, we're going to baptize infants so that we can extend that sign of the covenant to them is to assume that he forms his old covenant people the same way his new covenant people. The church is not set up along familial or ethnic lines. It's not about what family you were born into. It's about being born again into the family of God. It's not reserved for just one nation anymore. It's all peoples and all nations. We looked at that last week. The spiritual state of an infant born to a believer is no different than the spiritual state of an infant born to an unbeliever. Both still need to be saved. Now, born in different environments, yes. Absolutely. But their intrinsic spiritual state is no different. The new covenant does not operate by the family you were physically born into, but the spiritual family you have been born again into. Pardon the bluntness, but under the old covenant, circumcision, the very act of cutting off a part of a man's body, threatened the fate that that man himself would suffer. He would be cut off from God's people if he disobeyed the covenant. You see this? In Genesis 17, so all the way back at the beginning. So circumcision was a way of saying, you got to live holy or you're going to be cut off from God's people. Circumcision bore the demand for holiness. Baptism is not the same as circumcision because baptism does not bear the demand for holiness. It is a declaration that you have been made holy. Holy. 
Furthermore, we don't believe that baptism in the New Testament is the equivalent of Old Testament circumcision because we're told that when we get saved, our hearts have already become circumcised. Colossians 2, 11 through 13. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your trespasses and sin, dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. Notice how Paul is using these metaphors here. Christians were spiritually circumcised when God himself cut off our old selves, put to death our sinful nature and gave us new life in Christ. You also notice the language that Paul uses to portray being buried with Christ. It's baptism. So the reason we don't baptize infants to mark them off as God's covenant people is very simply because they are not yet part of God's covenant people. So we don't want to apply to them the sign of a covenant that they are not in. They have not been buried with Christ and raised through faith yet. So we don't want to baptize somebody. We don't want to give them the symbol of something that hasn't happened internally. We don't want to portray something that is not yet real. We don't apply the sign of a covenant to a person who is not a member of the covenant. Old covenant circumcision said to Israel, make yourself new. New covenant baptism says to Christians, this one has been made new. Baptism portrays our new life in Christ. And lastly, baptism portrays that we are one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. Just like water baptism is symbolic of our new life in Christ, it's also symbolic that we are now one body. So when a person gets baptized, we as a church are declaring, this person is one of us. And the person getting baptized is declaring, I am one of you. We are one body. Like we've been saying throughout our message, baptism binds one to many. Communion binds the many into one. So in conclusion, here's what I'm going to ask of all of us. We've talked a lot today about pictures of the gospel, about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. If you're here today and you're not a believer, or if you're watching online and you're not a believer, and you have questions about the gospel, or if you have questions about what it means to be a Christian, I would love to speak with you after the service. I'm going to be in the lobby after the service. Feel free to come up to me, and we'll, we can talk about it. I can answer any questions that you may have. I'll give you my phone number. I'll make myself available to you in any way you need to clarify and understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If you were here this morning and you came with a friend or you're watching because of a friend recommended it to you, I would encourage you, ask them. They would love to help you do the same thing. But don't simply leave here without at least beginning the conversation. I understand if you got a jet right after the service, that's okay. Uh, in the seat in front of you, there's those connect cards. Grab one of those out, put your information on it, check the box that says, I would like more information about salvation. You can drop that off at guest services. I will personally be in touch with you this week to answer any questions that you have. Now, if you are a believer, but you would never have been baptized, I would encourage you to do the same thing. See me after the service. We would love to schedule a time for you to be baptized. Or you can fill out that connection card. Put your info. Check the box. I would like more information about getting baptized. I would love to be in touch with you this week. Or if you have time, see me after the service. We would love to meet with you to hear how you came to Christ and get your baptism scheduled. Sunday, April 17th is Easter Sunday. On Easter, the church celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, any day is a good day to be baptized, but, be ba but to be baptized on Easter when we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, I think would be special. I mean, what better day to dramatize your faith in his death, burial, and resurrection than the day we celebrate his resurrection? So if you're a believer, but you've never been baptized, let me encourage you to consider making your faith public on Easter Sunday. We would love to celebrate with you and affirm God's work in your life. For those of us who profess Jesus here today, which is probably going to be most of us, our next communion service will be on Friday, April 15th at 6 p.m. On the liturgical church calendar, this is Good Friday. It's the Friday right before Easter. It's the day we have set aside on the church calendar to remember Christ's death. And so I believe we should observe communion often as a church family.
But this is a day that we definitely want to set aside to remember his death and remind ourselves that we are forgiven. So let me encourage you to make that service a priority. I know we're busy, but this is, this is important. This is one of the ordinances God has given to the church. So let me encourage you, Friday, April 15th, 6 p.m., say, I'm going to be here so I can gather with my church family so that together we can remember Christ's death. We can publicly declare we are one, and we can anticipate his resurrection. And as we move closer to Easter, let me challenge us to adopt an attitude of prayer. Let's adopt an attitude of reflection and anticipation of what we're celebrating. I'm praying that this season would, be a renew, would give us a renewed sense of purpose as we move into observing Good Friday and Easter. I want us to have this renewed sense of purpose as to the reason why we're observing and the reason why we're celebrating. Because God, I'm praying that God would use it to renew our sense of his love for us and to renew our love for him. And that it will give these ordinances fresh purpose in our hearts and in our lives. Let's pray. Father, I pray that now that we as a church have heard your word, that we as a church would be doers of your word. Lord, I pray that your word would help us as a church to grow in holiness like fruitful trees planted in your righteousness declaring your glory. I pray that your word would have fallen into the soil of tender hearts this morning. 